Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Bontrager has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, The Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back, Rock the Stage Show. It's Sunday night, 7 o'clock, and we're back once again with you and we're going to get into many of the different topics that you heard. Sandra D. Robinson, that amazing voice over there. By the way, great, great stuff coming from Sandra. She's going to be back on the show. And we got some great surprises coming. So don't miss all that. But we are going to get into executive. We're going to get into TV. We're going to get into all sorts of amazing things with one guest tonight. And don't forget, we are streaming live 7 o'clock on YouTube right now. So drop questions in the chat. Join the conversation. Ask questions. Make a suggestion. And, of course, we're always on our new platform in 17 different countries so far, streaming around the world on the Public Place Network, or PPN. Thanks for making it all possible. Thanks for our sponsors making it possible and being a part of a Rock the Stage show. But tonight, we are going to get into one of the hottest topics out there right now, artificial intelligence. You're going to want to pay attention to this one. But let me start with a question here tonight. AI, is it a friend or foe? Are we at the beginning of Skynet, remember? Terminator and Skynet, is there a love-hate relationship between AI, the business world, and your personal life? Think about that. Is there a tug-of-war going on right now? And tonight, we're going to get into the big, big, big question. What does the world and our future look like with AI? And if you're not asking yourself these questions now, you will by the end of this show, I guarantee you tonight. Kurt Doty is a seasoned professional with over 30 years of experience in the fields of creative direction, new media, and marketing and communication. He's a former NBC Universal executive. He has founded Kurt Doty Company. And Kurt's mission, listen to this, Kurt's mission is to harness the power of AI to create captivating digital content and experiences that engage and delight customers. You got to love the way that sounds, don't you? Here's Kurt Doty coming on to join me on Rock the State Show. Kurt, welcome. Hey, I try to recall whether actually ChatGPT wrote that positioning for me, but whatever, <laughs> it worked, right? So let's go with it. You know what? That's where the fun is. It can help you. It can hurt you. And I'm sure we're going to have a great time talking about it here tonight. But before we get deeply into all this, I want to talk about you and I share one thing in common. We mostly have over 30 years in media. Yeah, I'm we're old, curious. We're old, we're old guys. <laughs> yeah, we, we're, <laughs> I've got the hair for it. <laughs> but what has kept you in this crazy business? It has changed so much. But what's kept you here? Yeah, I, you know, curiosity is the main word. Um, I think if you're a true creative, uh, you're always looking for something new to keep you stimulated because generally creatives are restless you know what is the next thing <laughs> and we don't want to get pigeonholed into any one thing and that's that's really been a, a guiding light for my career is, is curiosity well you've been called a technology disruptor what does that mean to you when they put the label on you do you like it do you embrace it yeah i embrace it i i've i've been in situations through various companies um where I'm looking on the horizon for that next wave, a technology wave. And usually I'm riding one technology wave of change and looking for the next one, just like a surfer. You can tell I grew up in Southern California. Um, a surfer looks for the next wave and he, he pulls out of one and waits for the next one. So um, that's what happens with technology, which is can be disruptive. And so uh, many times I've been faced with, okay, Am I facing the disruption or just succumbing to the fears and being very passive in any type of career growth? And so by embracing the disruption, uh, you, you, you embrace this feeling of fear, meaning mm -hmm. I'm uncomfortable, I'm, I'm not in a, in a safe territory, and that's okay because you're forging new experiences and new ways of working and you have to work through it embrace that fear to embrace the new and, and the new presents all kinds of possibilities and that's guided my career 
through a lot of ch changes and going into different industries uh, because of that curiosity. So well, that, yeah. that's how I've you know, been disrupted because I, I bring in new strategies and new capabilities that challenge the norm. Uh, when people, companies are just doing what they know yes. that they've done for years, but yet everything around them is changing business models, industries, uh, distribution of films, technology, interactivity, all these things are changing. You, you can't just hold on to these old ways of doing things because uh, you're either going to be first one in or last one out. So, well, that's like catching the wave. You, you, I mean, you can catch it too early and it peters out. You can catch it on the backside and it was no fun. You got to catch that wave right at when it's going to take off. You have to know how to ride that wave. And you've done it successfully, it sounds like. 22 mobile apps, Web3 actually work with, social media work with, Gen AI. What haven't you worked with? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you glanced over a lot of the interactivity uh, that I did on the movie side in my yes. movie, movie career um, when I was at Universal. I uh, creatively led the charge for figuring out <clears throat> how to make movies interactive on a HD screen via a disc and then a connected disc. And again, it was really uh, disrupting the normal which was a very lucrative DVD business, right? Yes. Uh, but things were changing and technology was giving us these tools, mainly Toshiba. Um, I was on the HD DVD side and they did have a better format, by the way, And uh, but they lost. But we were pioneering uh, interactivity that has yet to be matched or paralleled uh, in any other medium. And so, but the problem was uh, that that wave uh, I caught too soon because uh, the movie watching experience on HD on, on HD TVs wasn't necessarily uh, the right medium for the type of interactivity that we were doing, even though, and this is like right at the birth of Facebook and social media, social media turned out to be the right platform. And then when the streaming media uh, companies came out, uh, a lot of the features that we're doing, you can see now in uh, X-Ray on Amazon uh, Prime. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were pioneering that stuff like 12, 13 years ago. But well, And you talk about all this. The new Hollywood summer films are landing this weekend. And one of them already hit and it's already considered a failure and one of the big questions that I'm reading is, is film and theater dead already? Have we already, I mean, we know they're not going back after a pandemic the way they did, but the fear is it is streaming. It is content on demand. It is the apps now. And the theater projects may be dying. Is this really here now? Well, yeah, I mean, I just attended uh, the streaming media NYC conference last week and, um, chaired a panel on AI there, uh, but also the discussion was about the general disruption of the Hollywood industry yeah. based, based on streaming. And even the streamers are at a, uh, you know, point of uh, concern because people have subscription fatigue. There's too many choices yeah. and there's too much content. Yes. Right. Even library content. You know, there's still a lot of great movies that were made in the 70s that are timeless and you can always watch them. Uh, so so going backwards in time, the consumer is in control and we are entering a user centric era where they have all the choices. But what's happened is that now we have subscription fatigue from all these streamers mm -hmm. because they're now modeling the cable bundle, which was you know, pissed off a lot of people to cut the cord with cable operators because, man, I'm paying a lot. And, I, you know, I don't watch sports. It's like, why Why do I need ESPN? Well, it's, you know, we are we are reverting back to the very thing you're describing. We, we left all that. And now you're seeing every Paramount's got like five different apps already back bundled together under Paramount CBS. We're yeah. reverting back to what we ran from. 
Yeah, because they don't know what else to do. And we're in new territory because the consumer is in control and the studios aren't. They can't dictate anymore. We have this model, like it or leave it. Uh, that's okay. We don't like it. We like your show that's streamed for, you know, eight weeks. Yeah, I remember when TV series were 26 episodes. Hello. Yes. And they had a yeah. summer break and then we had another 26 weeks of, sh but now there are eight. Yes. Somehow that's TV now, uh, but it's in a streaming era, but there is, there are a lot of good, great shows, a lot of choices, but the, the consumer habits are, and these are new and unparalleled is that they're just uh, canceling their subscriptions when that favorite show ends, like Shogun, it ended. Yeah. Yeah. What else are you going to watch on FX until Bear Season 3? The Bear Season 3 comes back or Shogun 2. I did it with Apple. Back two years. Yeah. I was watching Silo. I love Silo. Yeah. And Silo is in about ready to come back out. But we dropped Apple. Yes, Silo was no longer there. Great series of books, too, by the way. <laughs> they may be better than the series. But, yeah, so, you know, what do the studios do with this customer behavior? Um, because they're not locking in long-term contracts, which was no. the cable deal, right, uh, that held us hostage. Now we're not held hostage. So, yeah, we'll just cancel, and it's a monthly charge. We don't have to pay anymore. And then when the next season comes up, we'll, we'll sign up for that one. So that's causing a lot of uh, unpredictability of where their revenue is coming from. It's based on the popularity of shows and the short seasons. So before we get out of the TV realm and then get to AI, the big hot topic here, the, the big bad bear in the room, I do want to ask you from your, put on your executive hat, what we're doing right now is new media streaming content, independent talk shows. I've talked with other film directors. I I've talked with other content creators in the business. What I'm doing right now with you is the new game in town. I believe we are now actually creating content that can be picked up anywhere globally, and you don't need NBC anymore. Did you ever think we were going to get here? Well, for years, there's been uh, this new economy with YouTube, yeah. right? And uh, the, the new media versus old media. And YouTube is the most watched channel on eight on your, in your living room now <laughs> okay so not only do studios have to compete with each other now they have to compete with youtube and its variety of content which is it's very different than um you know what's coming from hollywood a lot of it's creator focus yeah. uh and uh it is a whole different spiel but people like it and watch it and that's why it's the number one channel on your on your smart tv so it's uh yes it's empowering a lot of people like you and i who have podcasts and they could actually be on a, a fast channel and i got approached by a fast channel company last week and they said you know you you could have your own fast channel and, and i was like oh well okay i hadn't even thought about it but they're right they're like if you have good content that's engaging you have good conversations people want to hear those you know just look at the rise of the podcast people are yeah. listening to podcasts exactly and and using that normally two or three hours of entertainment hours per day yeah just listening to podcasts and that's no visual medium uh, well, we've got four years of rock to stage we've we've well surpassed 100 episodes Congrats. and we're still going strong yeah. and this is where the new frontier so love to talk about that i mean we could do a whole show just on that but i want to get into ai yes and i want to read a little quote from here that you said and i want to make sure i get this right that we are at an infection inflection point we have an insane acceleration of technology in the form of AI. We are at the nexus of the next evolution of us as humans and the future of work. Yes. Wow. Absolutely. Did you pull the grenade pin out? 
Yeah, I mean, that's where we're at. And, uh, you know, I, I chose my words carefully because <laughs> originally when I wrote that, it was like I said the evolution of man. And it's like, no, let's not go there. It's the human race. It's, it's inclusive yes. of females. So, you know, it's it's the workforce in general. And we are at an inflection point. If you study technology uh, over the last three million years, fire was the main technology that you know made some change in our, our human, human lives right but nothing really happened until the first industrial re revolution and the second industrial revolution and since then it's been a hockey stick now ai is a hockey stick on top of that <laughs> hockey stick in, in terms of the acceleration of growth it's insane and murphy's law is no no longer applies and so uh, we're, we are in a strange new territory, and uh, it's moving so fast that the governments can't keep up with regulation, uh, the lawyers can't keep up with the lawsuits, and companies uh, can't keep up with what they're supposed to be doing is developing AI policies around uh, governance and ethics and, and legalities of use within their own companies. So um, what, what the latest numbers are that there's about 78% of people are using AI, okay? Mm -hmm. Whether the company knows it or not. Uh, but only 6%, this is from a CNBC poll, only 6% of companies have formed a policy that allows their employees to use it. And that's a gap. I see it as a gap of opportunity because I think there's a huge upskilling opportunity in the world, in the United States for sure, and Hollywood, which is the last uh, industry to really join the revolution for various reasons. We all know you mentioned Skynet uh, being one. <laughs> so, so that's that's where we're at. And you know, the fear is job displacement. I, you know, my son is a an account a CPA at a big firm rising star there and yeah. he's now you know middle middle management and i asked him it's like so what do you think about this ai thing and he says oh it's gonna it's gonna wipe out the entire bottom of our period uh, pyramid of the uh data entry staff uh they'll just be gone because ai will do it and then uh he feels he's safe because he's on the more client relationship uh new business side uh, but he still reviews uh, that work, which was done by people before, but now it will be done by AI. So that's just one industry. And AI has far reaching implications and opportunities to transform businesses in, in a new way. And I think it's, it's important for business to realize that they should be focused on focusing on the business transformation versus job destruction. What? I'm going to play the other side of that because Please. we're seeing stores, restaurants vanish because you can now click a button, order online. The AI will help you order your stuff, never even talk to a human, and you don't need the restaurant anymore. We're seeing greeters at Walmart and other places disappear because you have a robot voice now greet you at the places. You have less checkout people because now you just scan it yourself, bag it yourself, and go home. Where does it stop? Does it stop? Or are we going to continue to go to a replacement of man and day-to-day -day operation becomes lesser? Well, there's always a, uh, a reaction, <laughs> equal and opposite to what you think <laughs> is going to happen. And, you know, the talk is uh, about what is authentic. <clears throat> and I'm a creative guy, so I'm concerned about, you know, illustration, movies, video, deep yes. fakes, all the creative endeavors that uh, Gen AI has uh, unleashed on the world to <clears throat> the mass population that, you know, may or may or should or should not have uh, entered into the creative space. Right. I call them AI hacks. But so, you know, from a creative perspective, you know, Gen AI art is now being called boomer art <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> So that's a generational thing that the younger generations, you know, suspect and they don't like it because it's old people who, hey, I can, you know, paint a flying pig in the sky with rainbow wings and, and then animate it. 
you know, it's like, but why? Why are you doing that? What What's the business purpose of it other than <clears throat> that's a hobby now? So, so the question is from the creative community: What's what's authentic? What's human? Mm -hmm. Do we? It's a pendulum, right? The pendulum can swing from digital to handmade, right? Yep. From <clears throat> what's unreal to real, from what's a real person talking with uh, like me with all my ums and ahs and like you know because i grew up in southern california have a certain way of speaking but somehow that's genuine and authentic versus if there is a synthetic version of me it would speak perfect english yeah. and wouldn't really sound like me my, my character so so those are what i i believe people will be searching for authenticity whether it's in uh, the creative that's done, whether it's how they get their uh, information, who they talk to. I've, I've always been concerned about uh, creating a human-centered AI. And I would go further and say, how about a creative-centered AI? Because this technology in the, in the hands of everybody not everybody knows what the hell to do with it, but with, when creative people get a hold of these tools, they know what to do with it. They can integrate it into their workflow, use it as a valuable tool to make them better and more creative and create a space for them finally to look for that next uh, innovation wave. Well, so here, here's another quote that I found from you. We need to move from the AI ha hacks making AI films to true creatives, which you're touching on right now, harnessing these AI tools. So absolutely. So true I, creatives can do this without poisoning the well, right? Right. Yeah. If you look at the uh, uh, Adobe Premiere AI demo that uh, came out <clears throat> just, I don't know, three or four weeks ago, Basically, within the tools that they're already that editors okay are already using, whether you're in advertising, film, television, everyone's editing. Okay, there's really great editors out there, right? It's a skill. Yes. Uh, they they tell the story at the end of the day because they edit it together. Um, that demo showed them doing instant rotoscoping, uh, instant uh, scene replacement, scene extension. Uh, prop additions, all these things with AI right there that tracks the camera movement. These are all things very difficult and, and uh, expensive to do. You know, the idea of fix it in post, well, now it'll be fix it in AI. So, yes. so okay, so you have the same editor in the same driver's seat saying, heck yeah, I'm going to use these tools because I don't want to send this shot to a post-production house for two days and get it back just because we needed to rotoscope something off of a wall, you know, they're just going to do it in seconds within the tools that they're already using. I don't see how that's uh, polluting <laughs> the environment or violating uh, anyone's copyright, uh, copyright laws because right. I'm in, I'm in the film that I'm, you know, the director shot gave it to me to edit. And I'm just making it better, you know, in a more efficient manner. And but so, yeah, go ahead. But does it mean, and I say this a little tongue in cheek, but a little bit of truth. Can any boob do that now? Because it used to be you were an artist in the editing room. You know how to do it. You know how to get in digitally and brush it out and do all that. Now, it, like you just said, click, click button and you're done. But that's based on something that's already filmed. Okay. So when I talk about AI hacks, yep, making AI films, there, there, there's actually a film festival now <laughs> that just happened yep. called the AI Film Festival. And, yes. but, you know, if you watch them, okay, initially AI movies, they're all limited to six seconds, maybe 20 seconds, maybe 30 second clips, okay, which is great for a little trailer. Okay, so yeah. you see a lot of these uh, AI trailers that they say are little movies, but they're all little quick scenes, right? Mm -hmm. With a little movement, and they they pl play on the genres of, of trailer editing, where you get the establishing shot, you get the lone hero, you get the <laughs> wide dystopian destruction uh, landscape, 
and you get close-ups of robots and you know yeah you can do all that you have a little you know life within those little moments but there's no real actors one <laughs> and and no. there's no sustainable dialogue there is no dialogue you know, no one's having a conversation. Sometimes they use a little voiceover to propel the story. Again, a trailer type of way to tell a story. Trailering is a art yep. in itself. I've done hundreds of trailers. So <laughs> I know I know a trailer when I see it, and I know it isn't a movie. Okay. So uh, and then you know, so they're creating little scenes, little snippets. But but even within those scenes, there's always just disturbing little flicker of things that aren't finessed and worked out, and they may cut out of it sooner or whatever. But they're th these tools are just not able to replicate anything like uh, a movie, like like so, Rain, like Rain Man. I talk about movies in the '80s, '70s, or whatever old movies. Yes. Yes. Yeah, is it going to create a Rain Man? I, I, you well, know, it's not. Well, but I, I just watched Dune, uh, part two. There's yeah. been a bunch of movies. Marvel really kicked us off huge with the 360 experience in the room. You can actually look at a camera, and you're in the scene. There's no sets built. There's no prop master. You're in a room with a couple of physical things, and everything else is AI, interactive. How many jobs have we lost just on set production? On set location, yeah, but even without AI, that was happening before. It's just special of the the pro, the progression of special effects and CGI. So, that's but is that good or is that bad? Because now we're losing that art. I mean, I like the physical well, sets. I like the fact you could see light reflect of it differently than AI. Yeah, I mean, there's nuance there, certainly, uh, but you know, the studios are also going to want to be more efficient with their dollars because. One, they've been <clears throat> spending too much money on bombs, like you know Jennifer's, J Lo's latest uh, AI movie, yeah. AI theme movie. It wasn't created in AI, but subject matter <clears throat> wise. So they're spending too much money on films. They need to scale back. And again, oh, the yeah. pendulum swings. I think this is a great opportunity for independent filmmakers to finally get distribution for their films, which are not AI films. They're done traditionally uh on a you know a uh on a on a nickel budget but they're storytelling in a human way and they're in the can mostly so i i think it will you know generate uh a new industry i think with the independent filmmakers of which you know since i left the studios i've been working with independent filmmakers so uh i know i know their struggle uh and and i know their passion and they want to do things traditionally so I, I was going to ask you you've worked with major major companies fortune 500 the major studios but you've also worked with the independent small what's the difference between working with them money <laughs> <laughs> but but are you able as a creative as you said earlier are you able to really put your stamp and create a voice with the fortune 500 or is it easier to put your stamp and really have an influence in the smaller companies well i will i will go further i have to say that you know a lot of people think oh it's so cool you worked with the movie studio you worked with all these directors and uh you know got to cut trailers and do marketing it's like that must have been the coolest job and it's like to a certain degree it was a cool job i you know i get you if you love movies you get to watch movies and read screenplays and then create trailers and marketing materials for the movies. But as a creative, and again, I, I use that word true creative. Yeah. Um, it's a little frustrating because in the movie business, the director is the hero uh, and the one with the vision. And then you get to, as a creative executive, get to kind of tell their story in a micro way, which is an art, you know, doing yeah. is an art. Uh, but it, at the end of the day, it's their footage. <laughs> they're their creating. Right. I came, I came from the world of branding where it was my ideas for a brand on image creation for a brand. And it was all, all about my ideas. Right. Right. So, so at the studio, I had to kind of give that up and say, yes, bow down to the directors. They are great. I, auteurs and visionaries <clears throat> but it's about them and their their vision 
So um, it's great to work with creative people, vision, yeah. visionary people. Uh, uh, but again, personal creativity, a little stifled at the studio, honestly. So now you also have launched something called Realm IQ, yes. Smart Adaption of Smart Worlds. Now, yes. where are we at with this new Realm IQ that you're playing with? Yeah, so uh, I, being a branding guy, <laughs> I knew that if you uh, started a new consultancy and had AI in it, there would be a million of them <laughs> the next day, yes. uh, a year and a half ago when I formed it. Uh, and so I said, I, there's got to be a better way metaphorically to talk about what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And so really it was, um, you know, Realm IQ, uh, the two operative words there are, you know, smart world. So IQ being smart and Realm is world, just reverse it. But, uh, and I knew that companies would need to do smart adoption to create not necessarily virtual worlds, but the, the own, their own world of their own business, right? Mm -hmm. And let alone metaphorically, the whole world is changing with AI. And so I wanted to be that consultancy within this world that's going through major disruption and be part of the change because uh, I had been in product development for 10 years mm -hmm. and in Web3 for two years frustrated at that because, you know, no one knew what I was talking about. Uh, it took me a while to understand what was going on. And I still don't know what's going on with NFT. Right. But the, the idea is that when, when uh, ChatGPT launched, you know, I, I quickly learned because of my tech techno savvy uh, that it was going to be ubiquitously uh, used and, and simple interface, uh, powerful results instantaneously. It was like, wow, I, I, I didn't want to go down and develop a product based on the technology, which was so new mm -hmm. and rush, do the land rush into that territory. So I, I held back. So this time I held off on that wave and I said, <laughs> let all these other people like fail and figure out that they can't make money at what they think they're trying to do. Right. So let's, you know, <clears throat> let big tech take over for a little while and be an advisor to companies and, and universities and colleges and and help them with the disruption and show them the true possibilities and err on the positive side, innovating for good of what you can do with AI instead of tapping into the dystopian uh, Skynet doomsday scenario. I'm still a believer, though. Sorry, man. <laughs> well, it's just because it's been visualized for you. Yes. Uh, yes. But it takes again. I and I, I implore you to really be <clears throat> be use your imagination to imagine the world that isn't that, and and move towards that, and imagine uh, business transformation using these tools, whether it's in Hollywood or not. Uh, that's the way to look at it. So while we're talking about Realm IQ, here's a QR code going to take you to a website but what's really there what's there well you know i promote my podcast which is realm iq sessions which is on youtube and spotify and all the podcast platforms i've also built uh, a, a stable of realm iq ai mentors from around the globe from uh, germany to singapore to help put on workshops for companies so you'll find about all that there on the website and then something different um, based on the fact that I've been in the startup community for the last four years and have now connections to many in investors, investor groups. I uh, started a uh, AI accelerator. So looking for the next AI unicorn and help and advise them uh, and connect them with uh, investors. So a little different than a creative agency, which I've had you know, for 10 years. That's still going strong, uh, the core business still, but all these other ventures just really trying to take advantage of the hype around AI and really what is becoming an, an AI world. And I talk about it's no longer the Internet of things, it's the AI of things. And with that mindset, you can start to see how everyone was promoting, uh, you know, connected experiences 
are now saying, oh, no, it's powered by AI. It's like, yeah, that's still a connected experience, you know. So, again, you know, bullshit detector. I hope I can swear on the show. But yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, got to, you know, dig down into some of these founders and their language in terms of what they're really trying to sell. And that's why I started the AI Accelerator, because um, as Sam Altman said, you know, you're going to have uh, a, a one person company with a billion dollar business based on AI. It's like these people need help to know what they're going into. Right. So, so let's go back to my opening question. Look through your mis your crystal ball. What does the world and our future look like with AI? Where Where is this all really taking us, do you think? Well, again, I'm going to err on the side of positivity. I'm going to say that there will be job disruption, job loss, new jobs will be created, things that, you know, jobs we haven't even dreamed about yet. But I, at the end of the day, I think uh, as we shift from uh, this idea that uh, AI makes us more efficient, we need to talk about how it makes us more effective. Okay. One is human beings given time back. Okay. If, if I'm more efficient, that, that's giving me time back. What do I do with that extra time? What do I do with that extra space? Right. Am I going to innovate more and think about doing things that I never thought I had time to do before as an individual or an employee? Or am I going to use that time to be with my family, go take a hike, or uh, you know, work on a work work my work life balance, right? Right. So you know, I I, I think time is a factor here uh, that's being given back to us. And what do we do with that time? And I'm hoping that people will innovate for good and use that time and the technology of AI to solve problems that we just didn't have the time to solve before. And again, I think kids growing up with this technology, they, they're not burdened by all the stress of us old guys. <laughs> and they, they have crazy open minds and are connecting the dots in new ways as they come up through their education, uh, embracing AI that, you know, I'm hopeful that the next generation is going to really take us to new places and solve some of the world's problems that we can't. We have a lot of problems in the world. So I'm going to wrap up with this and I'm going to go to a comic book phrase with great power comes great responsibility. You just wrapped it up very beautifully going to that context of AI can be a great tool, but what are you going to do with the new time you have? Are you going to put your feet up and coast or are you going to go do something new, fresh? There is a lot of potential with AI, but there is that danger thing that it will call us become a lazy world again because it's doing everything for us yeah i think it's, again uh if you think it, of it from a human-centered approach we have to focus on what does it mean to be human uh humans crave interaction with humans yes. uh creative endeavors are human being creative is human uh the creative results are human so i think there's a lot of humanity uh still in people certainly creative people and uh, I think those creative people are the ones that are going to use these tools to take it to the next level and innovate for good. And we'll have the imagination to imagine a world and new business models and, and new creativity that will uh, change, you know, all the all the copyright laws that we have right now. They're ancient. They're hundreds of years old, <laughs> if not 50 years old. And they just don't apply to what's happening. So. There needs to be great imagination on the legal and governance mm -hmm. side. Yes. Right. So, but it takes an imagination, right? To yep. imagine a new world and how to govern it. And and old old rules don't apply. All the old models don't apply. So it's going to be people with open minds and creative minds uh, that will get us over this hump. So that's that's my positivity message. Kirk Doty, it's been great to have you here. There's going to be a lot more going on the next several years with AI, and we just may have to have you come back and help us unravel all the chaotic noise out there. No problem. It's a fast-moving train. Keep keep track of it and follow me if uh, you want to keep track of it yourself and follow me. And I'll help you, but uh, thanks for having me. Great to have you, Kurt. Kurt Doty, again, awesome to have him here. Again, it's such a timely, timely conversation. 
we're reading about it, we're hearing about it, it's advancing like so fast. Just when you figure out one version of AI, a new version is coming up right behind it. <laughs> some people are loving it. Some people are totally blown away by it. Uh, again, um, that human factor. And that's where I'm landing personally, just so you know, I'm going with AI is a tool, but I want to help you shine on camera, shine on stage and elevate your brand. The human factor is far more important than the gadgets and gizmos. Hey, that's going to do it for tonight in our edition of Rock the Stage Show. Thanks for joining us here tonight. Don't forget, follow us on the PPN Network, subscribe to the channel or on our YouTube channel, and always add a comment, throw in a question. We want to hear from you as we do Sunday night premiere nights, 7 p.m. Eastern time every Sunday night. Hey, until next week, I'm the Trigger, Rich Bond Trigger. We'll see you back here at 7 p.m. Eastern time for another edition of Rock the Stage Show.